I've been seeing some interesting titles of submissions on my website lately, so I wanted to dive back in today and read more stories on my favorite subject, creepy creatures. So enjoy these allegedly real sightings and stories about creatures that live in our nightmares, but sometimes come out for a visit. Today's episode features unexplained animals seen in the Appalachian Mountains, the United Kingdom, Kansas, and more. And if you have a story of your own to share, send it to us at darkstories.org. Now, let's begin. Something Very Strange on the Back Roads of Kansas From Pity K My friend and I were young adults around 2007-2008 in a small town with nothing much to do. So one summer between college semesters, we decided to explore the back roads of our part of the state at every chance we got. We spent a lot of time driving down those dirt roads. A favorite route of ours wound through the country roads of a town near the Oklahoma border twisting through the gypsum hills and taking us through a few ghost towns along the way. We'd set out late on this particular night and hadn't gotten to our route until maybe one o'clock in the morning. We had just taken a turn onto a previously unexplored, by us anyway, road, and were headed south towards the state line, chatting up a storm and sipping Arizona tea. I was riding passenger, looking out the window into the darkness of the Kansas summer night. Not much to see, but endless stars overhead. I can't remember what we were talking about, probably our future plans or something, but as we cruised at about 45 miles per hour down the dirt road, I saw something that startled me. Up ahead, caught by the headlights of my friend's car, I saw a shape stand up in the tall grass alongside the road. My friend saw it too, and he began to pump the brakes. Initially, I thought it was a deer, a very common animal in these parts, and it was about the right size to be one, around five feet tall. Whatever it was, it turned to look at us as its eyes lit up in the glare of the headlights, showing bright red. As soon as it had looked at us, it darted across the road. We realized then that it wasn't a deer. We didn't get a good look at what it really was, though, as it moved far too quickly. But the details we could agree on was that it was relatively tall, it was covered in dark fur, and it ran on two legs. We sat in the middle of the road, looking at each other for a moment, with that WTF expression on both our faces, and then my friend decided to goose it and get out of there. As we hauled down the dirt road, away from whatever that thing we just saw may have been, we couldn't stop speculating about it. The hell was it? My friend suggested a chupacabra of all things, and appropriately, I responded with a little Bigfoot. Whatever it was, it was strange. Nothing either of us had seen before, and what happened next was just as bizarre. Heading towards us at roughly 1.30 a.m. on a summer's night, about 30 miles from the nearest inhabited town, was a pair of headlights. Nothing too odd about that at first, even though we were way out in the sticks, there were still farms around. This vehicle caught up to us quickly. He had to have been going double our speed at least, about 75 or 80 miles per hour. As they roared past us, we noticed the details of the vehicle. It was a large, fairly new white SUV, not a farm truck by any means. And why was he going so fast? He was going too fast to make out a plate. Weird, we thought. We chalked another one up to that night's high strangeness, but that wasn't all. As soon as his taillights disappeared in our rearview mirror, back in the direction we'd seen that creature, no less, a fresh set of headlights appeared ahead. This one was screaming towards us, and as the vehicle passed, 
we noticed that it was the same model as the previous one, a white SUV. If that wasn't creepy enough, another one followed shortly behind it. This one was a new, clean-looking, large white van. It was hauling tail, too, obviously a part of the crew of the other two. These days, my friend and I don't talk anymore, but we both witnessed something strange in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, that night. What was it we saw? And for what reason were three new, huge white vehicles heading in the direction of that thing? Don't Go Up the Holler from First Sergeant Calf. My grandparents lived in the Appalachian Mountains of Eastern Kentucky. I spent endless summers on the farm with my brothers and cousins when I was a young man. We could go anywhere, except for one holler. My grandparents always said that one was out of bounds. Fast forward 35 years, I am a veteran of the United States Army. We, being my brothers and other family, had gathered at the farm yet again. We were there to lay to rest the last of our grandparents' children. The family cemetery is located on the backside of the farm. After the service, we got together for the traditional meal. It didn't take long for the topic of the forbidden holler to come up. A few of us decided we would head up there to check it out finally. At about 2100 hours, Myself and three of my brothers and four of my cousins met at where the old home site was. Nighttime in the mountains of eastern Kentucky meant there are all kinds of critters roaming around. Bears and bobcats are just a few of the larger animals. So needless to say, we were all armed. After a four-mile hike straight up the side of this mountain, we came across a flat clearing with a foundation and a stone chimney. We decided that this would be a good place to rest. My older brother, Ed, said that this was probably the original homestead. We sat down and waited to see if anything would happen. After about two hours or so, we could hear something coming down the holler. The footfalls were of a person, not an animal. We listened for around 10 minutes. They drew closer very slowly and then we saw it step out from the tree line. A very tall looking person. From its silhouette, it appeared to be over six feet tall easily. No one in my family was taller than this thing, so it could have been upwards of seven feet. I remember wondering, who is that? When I saw its legs, the knee was bent in the opposite direction. This wasn't a person. It walked forward, out from under the canopy. Its pale skin became visible, and lips that were solid black reflected the moonlight. And behind those lips were rows upon rows of teeth. It seemed to look up at the moon. It stretched out a bit, showing just how long its limbs were. Everything about this creature was unnatural. It was only then that I realized I had my revolver in my hand, and it was shaking violently from my trembling form. As if by instinct, I raised up the weapon, and I fired at it. It didn't even react, but my family definitely did. They screamed and yelled at me for the sudden outburst. As for the creature, it turned and disappeared back into the tree line. There was no sign of injury anywhere. We made an uncomfortable and awkward walk back, always looking behind us every few seconds. We still didn't know exactly why we weren't allowed in that holler, but we did have a lead, a lead that we would never go back to follow up on. Unknown Creature in Southeast England from A.L. Wellsford Every year since the age of 10, me and my two friends, Joe and Phil, would venture to a nearby woods to camp out and get away from the general noise from our local town for a few nights. 
Now, some years later, we all still meet up, but our gear has improved over the years. When we were 15, we would have a night that would be left ingrained in our minds forever. We always took a midnight feast consisting of nachos, popcorn, and as much chocolate as we could carry back then. All of it to be washed down with a huge bottle of vodka, lifted sneakily from whoever's parents hadn't locked it away. Generally, we would take it in turns to see who could scare the others the most with pranks. This particular year, we couldn't get any alcohol, so we had to settle with good old Dr. Pepper. It must have been 1 a.m. at the time. You could hear the call of the resident owl, the unmistakable sound of crickets, and the odd fox wandering through the surrounding bushes. Until, all of a sudden, we heard the sound of something much bigger just outside. We climbed out of our tent only to catch a glimpse of a deer-like thing looking up at the night sky, standing on two feet with what appeared to be antlers with one side broken. We stood in our half stances, absolutely frozen out of shock until Phil backed up and stepped on a twig, making a crack that echoed throughout the forest, announcing our awareness. This made the creature snap its head and look at us without moving any other parts of its body at all. It looked impossible to do without snapping its neck the way it had its head angled. All of us were ready to turn and run as quickly as possible at a moment's notice. Yet we stood there, like we were in a trance, or maybe that's what shock is like. Finally, the creature turned its entire body around to face us, and its head stayed still, like the way a bird's head does when you move its body. I should mention that it was no more than 20 feet away from us. There was a distinct putrid smell, like that given off by a rotting pile of garbage. I was slowly reaching for a fallen branch, because anything would be better than nothing to defend myself with. That's when I saw the thing's hooves. Of course, they weren't hooves. They were hands with long, bony fingers, palms on the ground. Suddenly, a low-flying plane flew overhead, which spooked this creature, thankfully, causing it to bolt away and disappear in the forest. I turned to Joe, and we both said at the same time, holy freaking Christmas. We turned to Phil, who looked embarrassed about something, and to our surprise, we noticed he had wet himself out of fear. But we didn't blame him. We didn't poke fun of him, either. We cut our camping trip short that year, but plucked up the courage to go back the next year. But we never did encounter anything like that again. To this day, though, I feel like I'm being watched every time I go back in the woods, but I don't let that hold me back. Stock to buy a crawler from Anonymous. I first saw this thing around 15 years ago. I was 12. I lived out in the countryside on a small stretch of land surrounded by dense forest. I lived with my father, who was an avid outdoorsman, and naturally we often hunted game in the woods and farmed the land, living separated from any major civilizations with the nearest town being well over two hours away by car. I remember it being a particularly cold night. I had just come in from putting our animals inside for the night, two horses and some chickens for those who are curious. I was getting ready to settle in for the night too, maybe watch some TV before bed. It wasn't long until I heard Misty, our mare, kicking up a fuss outside. She sounded awfully distressed, so I went to the window to see if any coyotes were prowling around. They were quite common in the area. When I looked outside, I found my prowler, but it wasn't a coyote. I wish it was. 
There I saw a tall figure, I had to guess about seven or eight feet tall, standing in the yard right below my window. It had a misshapen and decaying body, with arms that were elongated and almost the size of its entire form, each finger tipped with curved talons. I slowly scanned up its body until I looked into its eyes, but all I found were two empty black pits on a bald, pale, and deformed head, mouth lined with jagged teeth. Those pits for eyes, they were staring back at me, and I felt my blood run cold, like it was staring into my very soul. I was frozen in suspense in that nighttime standoff, until the thing spoke like a person. Come here. Come here. Everything about the way it spoke was wrong. It was monotone and distorted, like ripping the tape out of a playing cassette. I ran back to my bed and hid under the covers until the sun came up. I stayed awake that entire night, too afraid to sleep, too afraid of what might be standing at my window. After that night, for the next month, I would check my window every time I heard the mare in distress, and nearly every night, I would see that thing again, skulking around for whatever reason. Sometimes it would watch our livestock, other times it seemed to be waiting for me and watching my window. At one point, I saw it raise its hand up and beckon me. This sent chills straight down my spine. My father passed away not long after that, and we moved to a different state. I thought that would be the end to this nightmare. I was making some tea one day. 10 p.m., I think the time was. I needed it to help me sleep after a very stressful day. I have these glass patio doors that look out onto a small creek not too far from the backyard. It was through those doors that I saw movement in the corner of my eye, and so I peered through the glass. There it was, standing plain as day. How it found me, I have no idea. Maybe it was just another one of those things. I ran to my closet in my bedroom, grabbing a baseball bat, then ran back to the door only to find that the creature was gone, leaving no trace. Now I'm starting to think I'm seeing things. Maybe it's all this stress from moving and losing my father. Maybe it's real. I feel like I'm losing it out here. But if I am truly sane that I'm just waiting like a pig to the slaughter. If you're wondering exactly what one of these things looks like, I believe it would be classified as a crawler or flesh gate, something quite similar to the creatures from the movie The Descent, something you don't want to ever have to see. Don't go into the jungles of Okinawa at night. From Ron R. My friend Jim and I were in the Marines when this took place. It was mid-January, and the weather wasn't too hot and not too cold. About what you'd expect in Okinawa, Japan, where we were stationed. Jim and I had been at our new unit since December, and we were lucky enough to be put in a unit that was doing field ops in the northern part of the island the following month. The day came where we were leaving for our field. We woke up at 0500. We did our normal things, like getting dressed, shaved, got some chow, then went back and loaded our gear into the trucks. Growing up around mass woodlands, Jim and I were really excited to get into the jungles of Japan for a week. We all loaded into the trucks and started out a long convoy to the northern part of the island. Four hours passed by when we started to lose all sight of civilization and could only see nothing but jungle. Finally, we arrived at the base camp 
where we unloaded all our gear and set up our camps. Of course, as luck would have it, Jim and myself got picked to have fire watch at 0300 the following morning. 3 a.m. came and Kale and Jones woke us up to relieve them. It was time for our watch, the last watch of the night. After getting dressed and grabbing our rifles, we started our rounds around the camp. About 20 minutes into rounds, we came upon a path that didn't seem to be there before. Jim and I felt that we could take on the world. We made the decision to see where the path led. It was still within our area, so it wouldn't hurt anything. After walking for a bit, I stopped because something felt wrong. We both crouched and listened for a while to the sounds of the jungle and wildlife around us. Suddenly, Jim tapped my shoulder. I looked to see what he wanted. Quietly, he told me to shut up and get down, so I did, and I looked in the direction he was watching. At first, I didn't see what he was looking at. Then out of nowhere, a set of piercing red eyes appeared. We sat still for a few minutes. We contemplated our next move. Jim looked at me with a cold and calculated look on his face and said to me, we need to figure out what that is. We both got down and crawled in the direction of the red eyes. Jim went right, and I went to the left. Halfway there, those red eyes simply vanished. We stopped and looked around for a moment to see if the eyes had moved, but we didn't find them again. Then from the darkness behind us came a loud scream. It was Jones. He sounded like someone was attacking him. Disregarding ourselves, Jim and I got up and ran to help Jones. We quickly got to where he was sleeping, but his tent and sleeping bag were empty. A couple of minutes later, our entire platoon was at the tent to see what was going on. We told Sergeant Blackwell everything. He then split us up into groups of four to go and try to find Jones. Jim and I took point. It was 5 a.m. when Jim found drag marks in the dirt. We signaled the rest of the platoon to meet up at our location. Once everyone was there, we all started to follow the tracks deeper into the jungle with our rifles at the ready. After walking around two hours or so, we came upon a cave Sergeant Blackwell sent myself, Jim, and Kale into the cave to retrieve Jones. We slowly walked into the cave, beginning our steady search. We must have been in there an hour before we found Jones unconscious and bloodied up pretty bad. He was lying in the middle of a large cavern. Jim runs up to him and grabs him, starts to carry Jones back. When red eyes appear in the darkness, Eventually, the eyes faded away again, and we ran for the opening, when all of a sudden, something struck me from behind. That sharp and sudden pain was all I remembered. When I came to, I was in the hospital. Jim was with me. He told me that we got Jones back safely. Thing is, over the next couple of years, a few more soldiers were taken to that cave, and a couple of them we didn't get back alive, and sadly, we never did see exactly what or who it was that was taking them. It was two years after this when Jim and I were stationed in the Middle East. I lost Jim to a ten-year-old suicide bomber in the desert. I'll dedicate this story to him. I miss you, brother. Werewolf of Dearborn, Michigan, from Ben S. This took place in the summer of 1996, on the night of a full moon in Dearborn, Michigan, in the Henry Ford Wildlife Preserve. I just got out of the army after an 11-year hitch. I hooked up with three friends of mine, two guys and a girl, talking them into going out into the woods for old time's sake. Now, I knew this place like the back of my hand, as I used to sneak in there when I was a kid. 
I had absolutely no fear of it. We were roaming around in there for an hour or two when we decided to head up to the old mansion, Henry Ford's actual summer house, via a rarely used trail that ran on the bank of the Rouge River. To the right was the river and to the left was a semi-forest, swampy area that would be very treacherous to walk through during the day, let alone at night. As kids, we dubbed it the Wastelands and rarely ventured in there. While we were hiking, my friends started to fall back behind me. I stopped to tell them to catch up with me, but as I turned, before the first word left my mouth, I saw it. It was about 30 feet away from me, moving parallel and running through that part of the swamp part forest terrain like a gazelle on an open plain. Its speed and grace bordered on the supernatural. It was thickly muscled, built like a bodybuilder, and was in the six to seven feet tall range, covered in black fur. Its hands had freakishly long claws, and its head resembled a wolf's, but much, much larger. Its hind legs resembled a dog's, but unlike a dog's, it was bipedal, running on two legs. To top it off, and I kid you not, it was wearing what looked to be a torn white shirt. The whole incident lasted about five seconds or so. It ran out of my eyesight, but before it did, I saw it avoid a tree that was half fallen resting low to the ground, but this didn't slow it in the least. I never saw it again, and I only spoke about this to a very close friend of mine. It wasn't until the advent of the internet that I finally realized I wasn't the only one that had seen this kind of animal before. Months before this happened, by the way, a friend of mine was going to renew his parking sticker at the college security building. He was attending classes at U of M and asked if I wanted to keep him company. While he was waiting for his sticker, I glanced at the bulletin board and on it was a notice warning pedestrians and students to be wary of a pack of wild dogs running around in the wildlife preserve. I asked the security guard if he knew of anyone who had actually encountered these dogs. He said no, but the reason why they assumed there was a pack of dogs on the loose was due to a large, sudden spike of animal carcasses being found ripped to shreds. I'm sure now these two things were linked together. Life is like a box of spore creatures. There are tons of different varieties of monsters in there, but all of them are equally horrifying. Except that one that looks like a butt with tentacles. In that case, someone's preteen kid had way too much time on their hands. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have a story of your own, share it with us at darkstories.org. Check the links in the description for a link to my Patreon where you can donate and a link to my merch store to get some creepy cool merchandise. Now as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode about creepy hospital stories. Internet in a nutshell channel says, not a good time to be heading to the hospital. I don't think any time at the hospital is a good time, unless you're having a baby and you're not the one that has to push it out. Joe Banny says, I'm excited. I'm going to be a nurse. This kind of scared me. That's awesome, Joe Banny. I hope you make it there. Here's to you becoming a great nurse, one that even the ghosts respect. No Need says, Hospitals freak me out. Too much coming and going for me. No thanks. And it's kind of like a soul super highway. Yeah, I know what you mean, but it also means it's prime real estate to sell ghosts some new iPhones. Sir Lucas says, Dang it, Darko. I just clicked on your new Skinwalker video. What do you want from me? I want you to watch every video I've ever made on repeat for eternity. Or to live a happy, fulfilled life, but your choice. And Mr. Video Game Pro says, Darkness prevails. Uploads a new video. Me. Heavy breathing. Oh, I think you made a mistake. Here, let me fix that for you. Darkness prevails. Heavy breathing. Uploads a new video. You. 
listens to strange fat dude at a computer heavily breathe while he narrates. Well, that brings me to the end of this episode, but don't you worry. More scary stories are on the way. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They're great people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.